lesson is from the sixth chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. You may remain seated as I read the scripture. I'm beginning at the 35th verse, and then we'll go down to the 41st verse. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Well, at this, the Jews began to grumble, grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our text this morning is, Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from Him comes to me. Now that verse of Scripture offers a great insight into God's teaching and what your response to Him should be. You see, the book of John has been one of the most praised and also one of the most criticized books of the Bible. And John defends the immortality of Christ more than any other book in the Bible. And John had a strong conviction that the eternal destiny of every person is connected to belief in Jesus, which is the idea of eternal life. First John says, and this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has a Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. Now the theme of belief here is obvious. Belief is a means to an end. John 20, verse 31 this is written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Life that's available through faith in Jesus is the main theme of John's gospel. Life. And John's view of life was that life began before time. And it extends beyond time. And life is most definitely found in Jesus. And he brought it down to this. John brought it down to this. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came down from the Father full of grace and truth. And this shows the reason the Jews rejected Jesus. They judged him by his human values, by external standards. 
You see, their reaction to Jesus' claim that he was the bread that came down from heaven, while they knew he was a carpenter's son who came from a poor home, and they had seen him grow up in Nazareth, which made them unable to understand how he could possibly be a special messenger from God. But in rejecting Jesus, they rejected life. And the book of Romans has the Apostle Paul's carefully constructed summary of Christian theology explaining God's plan of salvation through faith. Divinely inspired, Paul presented truths that are followed by believers to this very day. And Paul presented truths that are so wonderful. They've had such a great influence on more people than any other book in the Bible. Think of John 3.16. Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the main message of Christianity. Declaring that God loved the world so much he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to die for the human race. And it proclaims that whoever believes in Jesus will not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16 is often mentioned as the gospel in a nutshell. It's, it's right there. Because it sums up the heart of God's love and salvation. Now when the Roman emperor Julian, the apostate, was emperor, he tried to bring the Roman Empire back to its pagan agnostic state. And he said, it was this John who by declaring the word was made flesh brought all this mischief. You see, John's gospel has challenged the most sophisticated minds as well as the simplest. You might compare John's gospel to a, a pool in which a little child can wade or maybe an elephant come and swim in it. It's available to all and it's a simple matter. Yet it's very profound because many have witnessed the vast influence this book has had upon them personally. No other book has played a greater part in shaping the doctrines of Christianity during the first five centuries than John. You've heard of T.E. Lawrence. He was a British archaeologist, a British Army officer, a diplomat, a writer known for his role in the Arab Revolt of 1916-18, the Sinai Peninsula campaign in the First World War against the Ottoman Empire, known as the Turkish Empire in Turkey. Well, T.E. Lawrence's activities and associations with his ability to describe them powerfully in writing earned him fame. I'm talking about Lawrence of Arabia. The 1962 film based on his wartime activities. Well, he was a close personal friend of Thomas Hardy, who was an English novelist, a poet. And while Lawrence was in the army, he sometimes visited Hardy and his wife while he was wearing his uniform. And one occasion he happened to be there when the mayoress of Dorchester, England was visiting as well. And she was upset that she had to be part of meeting a common soldier 
She had no idea who he was. And she said to Mrs. Hardy in French that never in all her born days had she had to sit down to tea in private with a soldier. No one said anything. Then Lawrence, speaking in perfect French, said, I beg your pardon, madame, but can I be of any use as an interpreter? Mrs. Hardy knows no French. <laughs> well, a, a snobbish and discourteous woman had made an awkward mistake. She had judged by appearance. And that's what the Jews did with Jesus. And that's what our lesson is trying to teach us today. You must be careful that you never neglect a message from God because you don't like or you don't care for the messenger. You wouldn't refuse a check for $1,000 if it just happened to be in a plain envelope. Well, God has many messengers with his greatest message coming through a Galilean carpenter. And for that very reason, the Jews disregarded his message. The Jews argued with each other about it. They were so taken up with their private arguments that it never occurred to them to refer the matter to God because they were especially eager to let everyone know what they thought, not in the least to know what God thought. You know, it might be that sometimes in a church committee meeting when everyone's pushing their own opinion, it would be better for you to be quiet and ask God what he thinks and what he wants you to do. After all, it doesn't matter what you think. It's what God thinks that matters the most. And some seldom try to find that out. The Jews listened, but they did not learn. And there are different kinds of listening. There's the listening of criticism. There's the listening of resentment. There's the listening of superiority. There's the listening of indifference. There's the listening only for a moment because you can't wait to get the chance to speak yourself. But the only listening that's worthwhile is that which hears and learns. And that's the only way to listen to God. The Jews resisted the drawing of God. Jesus told them, stop grumbling among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. Only those who accept Jesus are drawn to God. Now the word John uses here to draw is in the Greek translation of the Hebrew. When Jeremiah heard God say, as the King James Version has it, with loving kindness, I have drawn thee. The interesting thing about that word draw is it almost always suggests some kind of resistance. It's the word for drawing a heavy net full of fish ashore. It was used of Paul and Silas being dragged before the magistrates in Philippi. It's the word for drawing a sword from your belt. There's always the idea of resistance. God can draw people, but God's people can resist that and defeat God's pull. Jesus said he is the bread of life, which means he is essential for life. So, to refuse the invitation... And the command of Jesus is to miss life. 
and to die. The rabbis had a saying, the generation in the wilderness have no part in the life to come. Well, it's in that old story of, in Numbers where the Jews refused to brave the dangers of the promised land after they got the report back from the advanced scouts, what was over there. They wouldn't go in and they were condemned to wander in the wilderness until they died because they would not accept the guidance of God. They were forever shut out from the promised land. And the rabbis believed their fathers who died in the wilderness not only missed the promised land, they missed the life to come. You see, to refuse the offer of Jesus is to miss life in this world and in the world to come. And to accept his offer is to find real life in this world and in the world to come. The most eloquent preacher of the ancient church was John Chrysostom. He was a bishop of Constantinople, and while he was pastor in Antioch about 390 A.D., he preached a series of 88 sermons on John's gospel. 88 sermons on John's gospel. Irenaeus, a Greek bishop in the southern regions of what's now France, was known for his role in guiding and expanding Christian communities. And he told of John's strong belief that God's judgment would come upon those who reject it. And those who heard Polycarp, he was a personal disciple of John and lived between 70 and 155 A.D. He was a Christian bishop in Smyrna. He died a martyr. He was bound and burned at the stake. And when he hadn't died yet, they stabbed him until the fire finally destroyed his body. Well, he told about John, the disciple of the Lord, who was going to Ephesus to, to bathe. You know, people had the baths that they would go. And when John got to the bath, he saw Serenthus was in there bathing. Now, Serenthus was a, a Gnostic who believed the world was created and ruled by a lesser divinity and that Christ was just a messenger from a far-off something. John rushed out of the bathhouse without having bathed, saying, let us get out of here. Even the bathhouse is going to cave in for Serenthius. The enemy of truth is in there. And Jesus said, everyone who has learned and heard from the Father comes to me. You must listen to God's voice. But are you a good listener? <laughs> you ask that of your students too sometimes. It's an essential skill in every relationship. And it includes your relationship with God. Most are better at talking to God than listening to God. They're quick to tell him their needs. But in such a hurry, you overlook what he has to say to you. And the sad truth is many would rather skip reading the Bible than skip doing something else in their daily activities. Yet God's word is the foundation of faith, the bread of life. You need to feast on it regularly, daily, if you're going to grow spiritually. Daily reading of the scripture develops a transformed mind. And that's what changes your perspective. It changes your desires, your attitude. 
it changes the words that you choose to use in your language every day. All of which should be in the Lord's will. Every verse in the Bible is inspired by God and given to you for your benefit. But you won't hear his voice until you make his word a priority in your life. If you ask, he will draw you to him and teach you to lesson. He will help you understand what he is saying in Scripture. If your spirit is drawn to the Father and your sensitivity to him is developed through prayer and meditation on his word, that's when you have a submissive heart that obeys his commands. You must, have, you must accept his truth. You must accept his wisdom, knowing that your faith leads you to Christ. So, seek God's voice through Scripture and prayer. Grow in your understanding and faith and embrace his love and salvation so that you may enjoy your eternal life with him. Amen. Amen. We're singing the hymn number 348 as our closing hymn.